Good evening. For those of you who have forgotten, I'm Jim Lutis. I'm the Executive Director of the Pell Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first lecture of 2013. Tonight, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a gifted scholar whose work is, is inspiring. Uh, Peter Andreas is Professor of International Studies at the Watson Institute at Brown University and Professor in Brown's Department of Political Science. He joined the Watson Institute in the fall of 2001 and currently serves as its interim director. Previously, Dr. Andreas was an academy scholar at Harvard University, a research fellow at the Brookings Institution, and an SSRC MacArthur Foundation Fellow on International Peace and Security. He holds an MA and a PhD in government from Cornell University and a BA in political science from Swarthmore College. Uh, Dr. Andreas is the author, co-author, or co-editor of nine books. Uh, these include uh, Blue Helmets and Black Markets, The Business of Survival and the Siege of Sarajevo, Policing the Globe, Criminalization and Crime Control in International Relations, Border Games, Policing the U.S.-Mexico Divide, uh, and Sex, Drugs, and Body Counts, The Politics of Numbers in Global Crime and Conflict. Now, when I read that uh, in preparing for tonight's talk, what struck me was that just those books, including the one that, he, that he's uh, talking about tonight, have all been published uh, since 2006. So I don't know when you sleep, but uh, it's, it's an impressive accomplishment. And not to mention that he's also published in a wide range of... Uh, a wider range of, of, of articles, uh, in scholarly and policy publications, including international security, foreign affairs, foreign policy, and others. Uh, his latest book on the politics of smuggling in America, got to work on my Vanna White, Smuggler Nation, How Illicit Trade Made America, has been called captivating, valuable, and entertaining, and was a publisher's weekly best new book for the week of February 11, 2013. That's why he's here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Peter Andreas. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for a generous um, introduction. Um, I always enjoy coming to Newport from Providence. Rhode Islanders think it's a long journey. Um, actually, for me, I'm not from Rhode Island, so it's just a quick drive down. Um, but I always come as a tourist, and uh, in the last 12 years since I've been at Brown, I've, I think I've given one talk in Newport. It was at the Naval War College and part of a panel. And just this semester, this spring, I'm giving three talks in Newport. So what we're doing, this is the first, um, it's all in this book. As you'll see, there's a local angle. Um, and the others are at the Newport Public Library and at the Redwood uh, Library later um, this spring. So if you want to get a, a second dose, you can, second round, and you can tell your friends if, if uh, you like what you hear and like the book, um, they can come to those events or one of those events as well. Um, as you can tell from some of the titles of the books that Jim read, I've been working uh, broadly in the area of transnational crime, uh, border policing, uh, trafficking of various sorts for quite a while, in fact, much of my um, career. And the more I've worked in this area, including spending a number of years in Washington, D.C., the more I've realized that what's needed is a real historical turn, historical perspective on a debate that I argue in this book and have been saying for a while now suffers from a severe case of historical amnesia. Uh, especially in Washington, D.C., the tenor of the debate, the content of the debate is that we're facing a fundamentally new and unprecedented global crime threat given the magnitude of drug trafficking, sex trafficking, migrant smuggling, intellectual property theft, and so on. And there's almost, not to overstate it, but there's a sense of gloom and doom, the sky is falling. And the message in this book is take a deep breath, it's okay, it's not like it's not a serious problem. I take it extremely seriously. In fact, in some ways I take it more seriously because I show, in fact, that this, this has been a serious issue, not just for years or decades, but actually, in fact, centuries. And not only has it been an irritant, but it's actually fundamental to the very making 
and development of the country in its foreign relations, not just with its neighbors, but more broadly, uh, globally. So what I do is, in this book, is retell the American epic, if you will, 300 year, otherwise well-known story, but retell it through the lens of smuggling and illicit trade, starting in the colonial period, all the way up to the present. So it's the longest book I've, I've ever written, as you can imagine. Uh, it's got 16 chapters, uh, and the whole idea, the impulse, was to provide some historical uh, background context for current policy debates. What I didn't realize getting into the research for this book is I'm an international relations scholar, so I think you know broadly U.S. foreign relations with other. I didn't realize how local the story would be, uh, how even intimately local the story would be. Uh, what I mean by that is the pivotal importance of um, Rhode Island in the early history, and not just Rhode Island, but specifically actually Newport, which I can say more about than I usually would because of the audience and where we are. But it gets even more intimate than that for me, which is uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, the Brown Brothers, the founders of the university that happens to be my employer, turns out to be <laughs> crucial players uh, in the story. Um, I'm not exaggerating, I'm just astonished how important they and their uh, fellow merchants uh, play in this story. So let me, in the short period of time, I certainly want to leave plenty of, of, of time for, for discussion and Q&A, but let me just give you some highlight stories from this 300 year uh, history and start in fact at the beginning and move up uh, to the present. So start at the beginning of course in the um, colonial period and it turns out in fact that uh, smuggling of various sorts was uh, absolutely an essential dimension of the local uh, economy. Uh, so much so that um, Newport and uh, elsewhere in New England, but especially Newport, were utterly dependent on the smuggling of uh, molasses from the French West Indies to basically keep its rum distilleries going. There were more rum distilleries in Newport than anywhere else in Rhode Island, uh, but Rhode Island and Massachusetts were where all the distilleries were concentrated. How do we actually know this statement about the you know, importance of illicit trade? Often we don't, but in this case we actually do. We know how much rum is produced by these distilleries, and we know how much is legally imported molasses from the British West Indies, which is allowed. There's this huge gap. There's no possible way that these distilleries could have operated with such minimal, pathetic imports of the legal stuff. So the illegal trade was actually keeping the distilleries running. Rum was the uh, region's most important export. Uh, it was crucial in the triangle trade in terms of rum going to West Africa, trade for slaves, slaves brought to the Caribbean, and then more molasses brought to New England, and the pattern repeats itself over and over and over again, right? Uh, now, what's interesting is that for much of the 18th century, the British sort of turned a, bra a blind eye. There was just sort of negligence, tolerance, a kind of, you know, loose approach to regulation. Uh, there's a lot of corruption as well, uh, uh, bribing gifts to customs officials and so on. It was so loose that British would actually rent out their customs posts in the colonies and they wouldn't actually show up in person. They would just have some friend of theirs showing up in Rhode Island as the local customs person. Uh, then what happened is the Seven Years' War, which was lasted far longer, was more costly than the British imagined. The British still won the war, uh, but they came out of it uh, broke. I mean, very much in debt from the war. The war with the French, um, it turned out part of the reason that it was so uh, costly and long is that the American merchants, who were officially on the side of the British, were also illicitly supplying the French. Uh, so they were basically profiting in both directions. Uh, and the French, in many ways, didn't have other alternate sources of supply than the American merchants who were, again, formerly on the British side. 
So after that war, um, which was decisive in shifting the geopolitical balance in North America, uh, the crown was uh, hard up for cash, and they said, you know, we're going to start actually enforcing the law a bit. Uh, we've just had too little uh, actual enforcement of our trade laws, which are fairly stringent trade laws. So the American merchants, who'd grown accustomed for decades of being able to violate the law pretty at ease, um, basically to widespread toleration of large-scale smuggling, were suddenly aghast and shocked and taken aback that the British were actually had the chutzpah to actually start uh, trying to collect what's written on paper is what they're supposed to collect from, say, the Sugar Act and, and so on. Uh, and I don't want to overstate the case, but I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that the American War of Independence, the, the, the outbreak of the revolution, that rum and molasses play an absolutely essential role. And this isn't me just saying that. It's uh, John Adams has a famous quote about how we should not be embarrassed. We should not blush uh, to admit the role of, of, of rum and molasses in provoking the American uh, Revolution. What's in interesting about the research is how much of the intensity, the animosity, the hatred, the, the spark, the furor towards the crown was not directed just towards the king in general or the empire in general, but at customs agents, customs informants, customs workers, inspectors, right? So these are actually the concrete face, the manifestation of what local merchants hated the most about British rule. Um, so that's the, the, you know, the several chapters on the build up to the American Revolution. Then the American Revolution itself has an important smuggling story. Uh, again, with resonance to contemporary discussions and debate about, well, rebellion and revolution. So we look, you know, we look with great criticism at uh, insurgents in Colombia or Afghanistan, and we say, look how much they're, you know, sustain themselves through illicit trade of various sorts. It's, a, it's considered a signature of new wars right now is that guerrillas uh, basically rely on illicit trades of various sorts. Well, that's all very true, often exaggerated, but it's all certainly true. But it's also been true for a very long time. And one need not look any farther than our own revolution and realize there's no way that George Washington could have possibly supplied his troops with desperately needed gunpowder and other supplies without massive smuggling. After all, there was no indigenous capacity to produce gunpowder. How do you actually defeat the world's greatest military power with a ragtag force of colonial rebels otherwise? Sure, the French intervened, but not for a while. And they wouldn't intervene until they really thought the American uh, rebels had a chance. Uh, so smuggling was absolutely essential to the very um, survival of the revolutionary effort and its outcome. And it's not just a smuggling story, but smugglers, which are merchants basically, they also doubled as privateers. So this was George Washington's navy, if you will. And this was very much profit driven. I mean, basically you get a sh cut of the loot and you call it privateering, but uh, the British considered it piracy. And when you get caught, they actually treated you like pirates. So George Washington's Navy was essentially a kind of pirate Navy or privateer Navy, depending on which side of the fight you were, you were on. Uh, the New Republic, so in the immediate aftermath of the American Revolution, one of the biggest challenges for the newborn American state is how do you get all these merchants who grew up socialized to think smuggling's just fine, even patriotic, after all, you're ripping the crown off, to suddenly be willing to pay taxes because any functioning government, however small and minimalist, needs revenue to survive. In the case of the United States, that was coming overwhelmingly from trade, tax and trade. It wasn't, the income tax didn't actually, federal income tax didn't actually come until early in the 20th century. So much of the country's history was hyper-dependent on actually being able to regulate trade enough to extract some revenue from merchants who are otherwise very hostile uh, to the very idea uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of doing so. I mean, the famous um, 
term is sort of no taxation without representation. Well, frankly, in practice, for many merchants, it was, um, they didn't want taxation even with representation, <laughs> right? I mean, they, you know, and John Brown, again, one of the founders of Brown University, led the effort of Rhode Island resisting to the last possible moment the federal, you know, imposts uh, on, on trade, I think it was about 5%. So they had to re-socialize the merchant class to say, okay, it's in your interest to pay some modest uh, 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 amount of money uh, to have custom service locally functional so that the government can actually function. In this regard, the very origins of the American state is fundamentally tied up to the creation of a custom service. You know, uh, uh, to the extent that the federal government was kind of had a presence, you know, Washington's far away, right? But, you know, uh, but what was actually present physically? Maybe the post office, but the custom house, right? And their job was to collect revenue and keep smuggling down um, to a minimum. Now, at the same time, as they are aggressively trying to change trade from illicit to licit, uh, I must say that the, the federal government, the authorities, are also very overtly, aggressively encouraging uh, the large-scale smuggling of British technologies into uh, the newborn American state. Uh, so today, hot topic, right? Intellectual property protection. Uh, a lot of finger pointing at China and other countries. Uh, but from the perspective of my book, the real message to China and other countries today is do as I say, not as I did. Uh, because basically, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Tench Cox, others who worked closely with him, uh, it was almost de facto policy uh, to encourage uh, the acquisition through any means possible of secret British technologies for the textile industry. Uh, not only that, the machines are useless unless you actually know how to use them. After all, they don't typically come with instructions when you smuggle them out uh, in small pieces and they're cumbersome, right? And uh, no one in, in the US has actually you know, gone to uh, learn how to use them. So what do they need to do? They also need to woo the, the machinists and the uh, artisans from Britain who actually have the know-how on how to use the machines. Well, guess what? It's illegal from British uh, law for if you have those skills to leave your country. So British immigration laws, exit laws, very, very restrictive. And so people like Sam, Samuel Slater, who's considered the grandfather, not grandfather, the father of the American Industrial Revolution, essentially self-smuggled himself to America, pretending to be a farmer of some sort. He left his tools behind, came to New York, and was discovered by none other than Moses Brown, the other Brown brother. Uh, I mentioned John. Well, there was also Moses. Moses was the nicer Brown brother. He wasn't a slave trafficker. In fact, he was an abolitionist. But he was very much interested in setting up uh, textile mills. And uh, so he hired Sam, Sam Slater to come up and uh, open a, a mill in Pawtucket. The smuggled machinery that uh, Moses had for him to try to put together and assemble was turned out to be pretty useless, but uh, Slater actually had a lot of know-how from when he worked as kind of a mid-level person uh, in England, and uh, the rest is history. He's now credited as a crucial founder in the sparking the early American Industrial Revolution in the, in the textile um, uh, industry. So this is blatant disregard of uh, British laws, British protections of its industry, and so on. And it wasn't just in patents. It was also um, copyright uh, in the sense of protecting, um, say, Charles Dickens, for example. He would come to America on tour, and he was outraged when he arrived and discovered that all his works had basically been ripped off and reproduced locally. Uh, and he's just very upset because he wasn't getting a penny from it. Uh, and the United States was arguably the world's leading hotbed of that kind of intellectual property theft in the 19th century. And it wasn't until authors like Mark Twain 
American authors started realizing, you know what, we have a self-interest ourselves in intellectual property protection, and so the United States finally signed on to international agreement, and then became a kind of champion of international property rights protections, uh, and conveniently forgetting about its own uh, past in terms of ripping off technologies, uh, patents, copyright, and so on. You know, so yes, today Hollywood producers and so on are very upset when their films appear on the black market in China and elsewhere shortly after their release, but arguably from a historical perspective, it's not so different than Charles Dickens being extremely upset with the Americans. After all, why import a bunch of bulky books when you can just import one and then reproduce it over and over again <laughs> um, and sell it uh, you know, locally very cheaply and the author doesn't get any, any, any of it and neither does the original publisher in London and, and whatnot. The war story continues in the sense I told you the link between conflict uh, and illicit trade in the, the American uh, Revolution. But the War of 1812, which we don't actually spend a lot of time thinking about these days, is kind of this obscure, forgotten war, but it turns out it's quite important. Not only is it quite important, but there's a hugely important smuggling story. So it was again a war with Britain. Um, and the big mystery, for those who look at this war carefully, is you know, one of the ambitions of the United States was to actually annex Canada. It didn't happen. So one of the non-events, I mean, imagine the things that turned out differently. The U.S. would be a much bigger country than it already is. Canada would be, I don't know, a bunch of new states. Uh, and it didn't work out that way. And part of the explanation for why it didn't work out that way is it turned out that Vermonters and, and people in, 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 in upstate New York and elsewhere Turned out they were actually far more interested in trading, illicitly trading with their neighbors across the line than in, than fighting them. It was very difficult for uh, U.S. authorities to actually get people in, in border states uh, to actually develop a war mentality about their neighbors across the line. Uh, and this proved to be strategically important because British, the British had a lot of troops uh, in Lower Canada. And they had supply line problems, and they turned out they were quite dependent on the illicit importation of American beef from Vermont and, and elsewhere that were keeping the troops alive, feeding their troops, and then they were able, of course, then to fight the Americans uh, and hold off. It turned, the war was a stalemate, uh, but they were able to hold off the Americans from actually conquering uh, and annexing Canada. So although we've forgotten about this war, the Canadians certainly remember it well, as the, as the event that, that means that they have independence uh, from the U.S. to this day, that we often forget it's even its own country up there. Um, you know, there's also a story of, uh, uh, you know, the, the war story goes on into the Civil War, long chapter on the Civil War. Why would, you know, extraordinary lopsided ba military balance between the North and South, why did it last so long? Why did over 600,000 deaths? This is the bloodiest conflict in our nation's history by a long shot. Uh, it shouldn't have been, I mean, given the lopsided military advantage of the North, it just shouldn't have been that difficult. And a big part of the explanation I emphasize in the book is that the South was kept alive um, partly through large-scale smuggling of cotton uh, through the northern brocade of, of southern ports uh, to ex smuggling cotton basically through the blockade uh, through, with blockade runners, first to Nassau and the, and, and the Caribbean, and then exported on to Europe, to Britain, and elsewhere, which were desperately in need of uh, southern cotton. Turns out there was also massive smuggling of cotton across the front lines, trading with the enemy, if you will. So northern cotton mills and Massachusetts and, and Rhode Island and elsewhere, also very much enjoyed acquiring through various means uh, southern um, cotton. So that also helped keep the South alive. Arguably, the war itself was partly provoked because the South had overconfidence that if war came, cotton would trump. That basically, first they thought the British would actually, Britain was so dependent on, on southern cotton, so the conventional wisdom was, that Britain would have no choice but to formally enter the war on the side of the South. Well, guess what? That did not happen. Britain formally stayed neutral while turning a blind eye 
to massive uh, blockade running by British built trip ships and often British uh, uh, manned uh, ships and captain uh, uh, ships. A lot of profiteering going on and some cotton reaching uh, Britain and they diversified as well, uh, India and, and so forth. So the South miscalculated, but the very idea that cotton would actually provide the financial backbone of their independence and war effort turned out to be a, a gross miscalculation. It was, it was enough of a backbone to keep the war going, but it was not enough of a backbone to actually end it the way that they had anticipated. In other words, the northern blockade was loose enough, porous enough, that the war lasted longer than anyone anticipated, but it was still effective enough uh, that it did not allow a fundamental shift in the military balance on the ground. I haven't talked about it much, but there's a long uh, number of chapters in the book on um, the smuggling of people as well. I mentioned briefly the sort of exit, clandestine exit of British artisans and, and industrial workers to jumpstart the American Industrial Revolution, but uh, there's also a slavery, slave trafficking story here as well. The US was in this peculiar position, uh, somewhat of a compromised position, if you will, of having uh, still having legal slavery in uh, designated uh, states of the South, but having banned by federal law in 1808, and before that by state law, including Rhode Island, it was one of the first states, maybe the first state to have a uh, anti-slave trade law, uh, which basically said no more importation of foreign slaves. So it was a criminalization, a prohibition on the international slave trade. And Britain was actually leading an international policing campaign on the high seas to, to put it down, uh, even as the US had legal slavery domestically, at least in the South. Well, what happened is, and many of you probably know this story, Rhode Island, in fact, uh, was one of the leading slave trafficking states in the sense of not importing slaves directly into Rhode Island during this period of clandestine importations, uh, but actually um, uh, outfitting ships that would then uh, supply Brazil and Cuba. Uh, and yes, some trickling of slaves still into the, to the South, all in violation of federal law. Uh, uh, in fact, the DeWolf family in Bristol, Rhode Island, up the road, they were thought of as probably the, the, the biggest slave trafficking family in America in the early uh, 1800s. And John Brown, again, the Brown University connection, he was not only involved in slave trafficking, including after it was criminalized, um, and in fact was one of the first people to um, be found guilty of violating uh, the ban on the slave trade. They, they confiscated his ship and gave him a slap on the wrist. Uh, and his brother, actually Moses, one of the people who helped draft the law. It was kind of quite a family feud there. Um, but he, it was not so much that he was a massive slave trafficker himself, but that he was so proud of it as a right uh, thing to do if you're a merchant, that he made it his political mission to protect uh, other Rhode Island merchants who were much more deeply involved in this than he was. So when John Brown actually went to Congress as a politician, he manipulated the system so that uh, the customs, uh, 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 the head of customs in Newport, which would normally have oversight over Bristol as well, well that person turned out to be not too friendly to the slave trade. So what John Brown single-handedly managed to do is to create a separate zone around Bristol, a separate custom house, and then appointed his own uh, customs person as head of it, who used to be the head of a slave ship owned by John Brown. Uh, and so for years, Bristol had this kind of de facto uh, exception to the law because no one dared enforce it, because everyone was turning a blind eye, whereas Newport actually uh, the slave trade uh, was declining partly because they were actually starting to um, uh, enforce uh, the law. Notice that I am running out of time. Notice that I've said absolutely nothing so far. This big story of illicit trade in America, I haven't even talked about drugs. <laughs>
Drugs, 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 drugs. That's the favorite story of the day, much of the 20th century in terms of illicit trade into America. It's obviously, uh, it's understood as the world's leading illicit trade. We don't know exactly the amount, but by all accounts, it's the, it's the number one illicit trade. And the United States is the number one importer of illicit uh, drugs uh, globally. Again, we don't know the exact numbers, but that's not a controversial uh, statement. But what's fascinating about this story that I'm telling in brief form here and, and in longer form in the book is that drugs are basically a relative latecomer, a late chapter in this longer history of illicit trade. But because the drug trade is so profitable and some sectors of it so violent, especially um, through uh, Latin America and Mexico in particular today, uh, and some time periods in the US, such as the uh, crack trade in the, in the late 80s and mid 80s in this country, it gets a lot more attention uh, than these uh, early histories. Uh, but again, from my perspective, it's just the latest chapter in a much older story. And in the last chapter of the book, I actually look at the full range of illicit trades that the US is somehow involved in um, as an importer, but in some ways also as an exporter often don't get a, doesn't get a lot of attention. So the, the, the illicit wildlife trade uh, is hugely important. Uh, get a few stories here and there in the, in, the, in the New York Times and elsewhere. China is a huge market for this, by the way, East Asia in general. But the United States is also incredibly important, especially, believe it or not, parrot collectors, snake collectors, and so on, uh, are almost as addicted to their hobbies as, as, as drug, uh, drug addicts uh, in terms of the intensity of their feelings, orchid smugglers, orchid collectors. And these are exotic niche markets, very profitable, however. Art and antiquities trade. Uh, also, uh, uh, black market trade, we could call it um, black market baby trade. The United States, I hate to use the term import, but I will, imports more uh, babies than all other countries in the world combined in terms of the adoption business, right? Uh, now, if you really look carefully, though, at this international business, a lot of it is a quite questionable uh, paperwork. And some of the countries that the babies are coming from, their uh, uh, orphanages have been shut down from investigation out of trafficking concerns. Guatemala used to be a huge supplier to the United States, and now it's dramatically decreased because of various scandals and, and so on. Uh, so this is something that once in a while will percolate, we'll get some attention to, but for the most part, we don't like to pay too much attention to it because uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's uncomfortable uh, to realize to what degree uh, the, the baby trade, if you want to call it that, um, uh, has some uh, questionable uh, sides uh, to it. So I'll stop there, I've gone over my uh, half hour, uh, and open it up to, um, uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, do you know if anybody's uh, dug into the details of the colonial trade? Uh, exactly how much was coming through? Uh, what percentage of the, the GNP, so to speak, of Newport was uh, uh, under the under the table and across the river and up the beaches? <laughs> right. Of the colonial period. Of the colonial. Yeah. Um, well, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is, by definition, we really have no good numbers on this. Anyone who pretends otherwise just is exaggerating or hasn't looked carefully because it's just by definition it's impossible to precisely measure uh, the importance of any illicit trade. However, some illicit trades are more easy to measure than others, and the ones that are easier to measure are ones that are basically a legal commodity, but traded illegally, so you're basically a tax avoidance or tariff evasion or something. And that was the story I told at the very beginning of the uh, rum trade, of the molasses trade to feed the rum distilleries, where you actually have a perfectly legal business rum distilleries, they need this crucial ingredient. We actually can measure how much legally they're getting 
and know that the gap between what they're getting and what they need has to be made up by the by illicit trade. So that's an example on this end of, of knowing for sure. And on this end of not knowing at all, uh, that's where you get into, I think, much more criminalized trades where, for example, uh, say slave trafficking into the United States after the federal ban of 1808, widely varying estimates, whether it's a few thousand, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, very politicized debate over the numbers. So what we do know is it existed, but we actually don't know how important, how sizable the, the illicit flow of, 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 of chained labor into the United States in the, 20, in the 19th century was after the federal ban on slave importation. Uh, but it existed, and arguably in some cases uh, it was important. Uh, but the actual numbers, it's amazing how wide-ranging the statistics are. I should say this is a problem also in contemporary debates. And again, the more legal the trade, the easier it is to measure. So you take cigarettes, great example of, of, of uh, showing the importance of the black market. Guess what? The number we have for global cigarette exports is, say, this much. And the number we have for global cigarette imports is a third less. Something's wrong, right? This imports and exports and imports should actually be the same number because you're exporting, therefore someone needs to import. But there's a third discrepancy. What happened? One third of global cigarette exports have been diverted to the black market, meaning uh, they're basically uh, tax evading cigarettes. So cigarettes are one of the commodities still today that has very high taxes. Uh, and so in the European Union, uh, Canada actually, uh, even within US states, there's variation in, in cigarette taxes. So there's uh, smuggling across, you know, from like Virginia into Washington, D.C. or into New York City from other states have lower taxes. Um, so those are examples of easier to measure. But it's, um, as I hope you, uh, to get a sense from the, the stories I've told, um, we don't have a precise measure of, of uh, any historical period, let alone the colonial period. What I did discover in the research is that the literature on colonial American history, or American history in general, including colonial period, is so rich and so well developed compared to that of most countries of the world that um, it's just filled with nuggets of incredible information on all things, including smuggling, but it's not aggregate data, right? Uh, so it's, it would be very hard to actually come up with a, with a hard number on the importance of smuggling, even though actually the literature on, say, commercial relations in colonial Rhode Island or New England in general is actually pretty well developed literature. All right, this might be a bit of a digression, but I wanted to ask about the, um, the baby trade, which was sort of a surprise to me. I mean, what is driving that? Is it just the, uh, the rules involved with the difficulty of actually doing adoptions here? Or I mean, what is driving that trade, as it were? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked. I mean, I, I uh, uh, don't have a lot in the book about that, but there are some, you know, there's a few good articles out there, including journalistic coverage, um, that can give you more details, uh, a few law review journal articles as well. The core problem is, frankly, guess what? Uh, a balance between supply and demand. Uh, and it's actually pretty difficult uh, uh, to, um, there's a high demand for all sorts of reasons in this country. People are having children later in life therefore often turning to adoption, uh, and um, there's not enough supply globally of babies. There really is, I mean, it's a myth that there's just thousands and thousands of unwanted babies out there. There actually are a lot of unwanted uh, infants, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, kids, you know, uh, five-year-olds, six-year-olds in orphanages, but if you actually want a, a, a newborn baby, it's a myth that there's actually this, uh, overflow of babies looking for good homes all over the world. And so, uh, and the adoption process uh, involves a lot of lawyers charging sizable fees uh, and a lot of paperwork. Uh, 
in less developed countries that you could imagine um, all kinds of questionable practices involved. In fact, the Canadian government shut down its adoptions from Guatemala at one point a decade ago when it, dis it started doing DNA testing and discovered that the women on the paperwork, a high percentage of them were actually, did not match the babies uh, that were coming to Canada. So they just shut it down. And then a few years later, uh, Guatemala itself uh, stopped. Uh, and it was literally a case of trapping. The exact details, uh, we don't know. Uh, but it is an understudied, under, glossed over in many ways, uh, partly because, as I said before, I think the, the recipients, it's something they prefer not to think about. Yeah, it's a great question. It's the kind of question uh, I get in Washington, which is where you came from uh, before coming up here. It's like, okay, interesting story. Uh, what, what, what is it? What's the bottom line um, for today? And, and you know, one is just have a little more self um, reflection and self uh, criticism in the sense that the U.S. is basically, in my account, a country that was partly born and grew up through smuggling and has become the world's leading anti-smuggling uh, uh, policing superpower. It is by far and away the, 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 the lead country globally in terms of cracking down on various forms of smuggling, especially the drug trade, but not just the drug trade, though it's selective. The small arms trade, the US obviously doesn't pay much attention to that because it uh, has something called the NRA keeping it from, from being too diligent about that, especially uh, trafficking in Mexico, for example. Um, but, you know, on intellectual property theft debate, uh, arguably the lesson today uh, is that, and this is a benign reading of the situation, is that some of the mass violations are just growing pains. That the United States grew out of it uh, through its own industrialization and economic development. After it had its own intellectual property to protect, it became an advocate, interestingly enough, of intellectual property rights. So, fast forward into the future, one would like to think, I don't know if it'll happen, but the benign reading of the situation is that China will eventually develop a self-interest in intellectual property protection. We're not there yet, but if history repeats itself, and it never does entirely, that that would be one way that China gets more on board is through purely its own economic uh, uh, development. Another uh, lesson learned, um, frankly, don't turn soldiers into cops uh, when it comes to fighting illicit trade. I didn't emphasize this in, in Summarizing the early colonial history of the British crackdown on, on, on colonial uh, illicit trade, but one move the British made, they said, look, our customs agents, they're so corrupt, they're so lazy, they don't, they're not professional, they don't do a good job. We want to crack down, we've got to do something about this illicit trade. What are we going to do? Oh, we've got the Royal Navy. So basically, they deputized the Royal Navy into becoming customs service. So you had British, you know, naval uh, ships suddenly patrolling Narragansett Bay, uh, and including the Gaspy. I don't know if you still know the story of the Gaspy, which is this British customs vessel, the military vessel, uh, which John Brown and some of his colleagues actually raided late at night because it was stuck on a sandbar, I think, near uh, Warwick. Um, and burned it down to the water's edge. There was this outrage, partly because the military had been uh, uh, gone on the offensive against uh, uh, the American merchants. Benjamin Franklin, uh, 
has this great passage, and I wish I had the book in front of me to, to, to read this passage, and I've used it in articles and elsewhere, where he basically chastises in very bitter, sarcastic words and tone the British for turning its, its military into an anti-smuggling customs force, uh, and warns that this will contribute to the corruption, actually, of the military, and they will overplay their hand and it will have a backlash. Well, that's arguably some lessons learned there for the current era where there's a temptation to militarize when police forces prove inadequate. No more evidence in Mexico where police are utterly corrupt, incompetent, getting better, but uh, the temptation has been in recent years, for a while now actually, to turn to the military uh, to do uh, anti-drug work. And as popular as that has been in some respects, uh, they're also a very blunt instrument. And if the military gets corrupt, who then do you turn to after to clean up the military? Okay. 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 Okay.